Okay, here we go. So free will, you guys can online can see the PowerPoint, right? I have it shared. Good, okay. So um, actually stop the share just for the first part of class. So some administrative stuff. I sent around an email earlier today about uh, majoring in philosophy as well as the philosophy club, which I think meets on Wednesdays. You guys know about this? Okay, yeah. So there is a philosophy club. They do readings every week. And I think there's pizza every week too. Is, is there pizza every week? Pizza and breadsticks every week. Um, I'll be giving a talk in two weeks and then two of the people on my committee, Natalia and Carlos, will be giving talks in November as well. So if you guys wanna show up, I've been encouraged to invite you all to be there for pizza and philosophy. Um, and then also if you're considering, so at this point in the semester, you should have a pretty good idea of what philosophy is and your enjoyment of it, your participation in it, your desire to like maybe move forward with it as a major. Um, so if you are interested in majoring in philosophy, you can reach out to me. I'm happy to share some information like facts and figures. Like for instance, as I said in the email, philosophy uh, uh, undergraduate degrees uh, score higher on every postgraduate exam, except for the MCAT, than every other major, because you have to like know a bunch of biology to do well in the MCAT. Um, and they tend to have higher mean salaries straight out of college too. So the uh, correlation between getting a degree in philosophy and uh, doing well materially uh, is there certainly, plus it's awesome and fun. Um, and then if you're really about it, you could follow in my footsteps and try to do the grad school thing and stick around in academia. So if that is something that you're interested in, um, reach out. Um, I can direct you to the right place or give you whatever information you might uh, want to know about from living the life of professional philosophy and, and all that. Um, and what we offer, so the University of Utah is kind of unique. We don't just have a philosophy major. We also have a philosophy of science major with like a specialty. So you'll choose like philosophy of biology or philosophy of cognitive science or philosophy of uh, science and mathematics or something like that, right? So um, we, we give you what are called like certifications, um, which, really just sort of pads your pedigree and resume um, in a specific sort of way for um, what you might be interested in for future degree paths or career or whatever. Um, so great, with that out of the way, um, midterms were on the whole really good. Uh, you guys kicked ass, so good job. Give yourselves a pat on the back for those of you that took it. Um, if you did poorly or not as well as you had hoped or you didn't, completed or whatever. I got a few tests that were just like one question. Um, you can up to the end of the semester, complete the midterm for half credit. So like up to 25 points instead of 50. Uh, so that's always an option. Uh, and the due date for that is um, the end of the semester. So same time that the final would be due. Uh, it's just like another option, uh, flexibility for you guys to earn points and get the grade that you want. Um, what else? Uh, I sent around an email today. Uh, for everyone who has 30% or less of their grade earned, uh, I do this every semester because it's like a weird grading system. It's idiosyncratic, it's different. Um, so really the purpose of the email is just to check in. Uh, I'm not saying like you're doing anything wrong. You're not um, just making sure that uh, you do have a plan to pass and succeed. Because if you're less than 30% with the amount of semester remaining, it's gonna get harder and more time consuming and stressful to do everything that you need to do to pass the class, right? Like every semester I have students who do everything on the last day, um, but uh, this is not the best strategy, right? So uh, students who do this, sometimes they do really well because they've been keeping up with lecture and reading and they just do all the work at the very end. Um, and sometimes they don't because they also didn't keep up with the lectures and the reading and so don't have all the concepts. Um, so, you know, if you have 30% or less of your grade, be thinking about your plan to succeed. And if you have thought about it, then great. Um, and if you'd like help, then reach out. I'm here to be a resource. Um, if you have more than that, good job. Keep on, keep it on. Yeah, question? Our, 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 sorry, our final grade, that just an accumulation of all the points that we have, 
Yeah, every point is 1%. So whatever you see in the grade book is however many percent you've earned in the class. Um, yeah, any other questions? Administratively grades, midterms, finals, plans for success, majors, minors. Get me the hell out of this class. Okay, all right, so free will. Uh, eventually. There we go. Okay, so um, the topic of today's lecture is, am I free? This is the big question for this week. Do we have free will? Uh, so what I wanna do is before we get into any of the content, First, just out of curiosity and like no judgment as ever, who did the reading? Who read the cider piece? It's like most of us in class online, far fewer. All right, well, do the reading. It's, it's awesome and it will help you learn. And it's a, you're missing out if you don't do it. But like I said, no judgments. So um, the cider piece today is a really excellent uh, reading because it gives all sorts of examples. It covers pretty much the whole of the contemporary debate um, from sort of a zoomed out perspective, right? So we're talking about um, arguments for and against free will and the really popular um, gray area uh, models of, of freedom and problems and, and whatnot. Um, and, and it's a really accessible paper too. It's just, Cider is abundantly clear in, in the way that he writes. He's uh, a logician at NYU. Um, and so he, it, he he brings the like form of logical I don't know, analysis or proof or whatever into his writing and he seems to at least to me to write his arguments like proofs even when they're fun sort of zoomed out um, surveys of whole fields uh, so it's a good paper anyways um, just to to begin and before we go through any of the content uh, who thinks that they have free will does free will exist. Are you free? Okay, how about online? Do you have free will? Okay, and then who thinks that they're not free? Does free will not exist? And some of you aren't voting. Again, this is cheating. Especially online, you're cheating. Okay, so it's hard to tell. Um, how exactly the class is split. It looks like to me, 30, 30, 40, 40 being the cheaters. Um, so I wanna hear from someone who voted, yes, I have free will and didn't do the reading, why they think they're free. Well, it's an interesting question to answer just straightforward yes or no, first of all. I can still do those things if I choose. Who would stop me? But I have a free right to do those if I want to. Great. Okay. So the the comment is that uh, I have the ability or power to choose and make actions in the world. Um, I couldn't jump to the moon, uh, and I couldn't, uh, you know, like tackle a NFL linebacker. I could try. Um, but at least I have the power to, to try to choose. Okay, so good. Um, somebody who did the reading and said, or didn't do the reading and said they don't have free will. Online too. I have someone in the chat. In some things. Anybody brave enough? Why don't we have free will? Who, why aren't we free? Okay, anybody. Who, who voted for uh, the fact that we aren't free? Because we started our universe all over again, but the same exact, like the atoms are all the same, we would still end up exactly how we are right now. Right. Okay. So the comment is um, if we roll the world back, and we'll talk about this, um, everything will happen just as it did the first time. 
Uh, why do you think this makes us not free? Uh, because it's um, like it was like it was in any time the universe would start, it would always happen the same time. Yeah. So every time the universe happens, it happens the same way. So why shouldn't I be able to say every time that this period in time comes around, I freely choose to come to class? I'm not free in that choice, even if it happens over and over in the eternal recurrence of the cosmos. Yeah, perfect. So how we define freedom can change just like with literally everything in philosophy, um, how we conceive of uh, our intuitions concerning it. So you might say, um, no, I'm not free in this, like I have the ability to choose sense, uh, but I might be free in some other sense if we redefine the word, redefine the concept to uh, fit with our um, other conceptions and ideas and models and scientific principles, et cetera. Good. Okay. So um, let's make the case more interesting. Uh, so, so we have differing intuitions on whether or not we're free. If you said that we're not free in general, try to put that intuition behind you for just a moment, right? Um, let's just survey some questions. Uh, you are choosing to listen to this lecture right now. Are you free in that choice? Did you freely choose to like come to class? You did choose online? Hello? Hello, yeah, okay, good. Um, excellent. So in fact, I'm just gonna stop sharing for this part. Uh, okay, so you freely chose to come to class. Uh, now let's say, um, let's just go for the, the thought experiment. So John Locke is famous for this thought experiment. It's the man in the basement. Um, there is a man who is sitting in a basement and the door is locked. He physically cannot go upstairs, okay? Um, and this man chooses, so he thinks, to stay in the basement. Is this choice free? So the, the choice being, should I stay or should I go, right? And he chooses to stay, but the door is locked. Is he free? Yeah. Does he choose freely? Yes. So who thinks yes? The man in the, in the, the locked basement who chooses to stay in it is free in choosing, yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to leave. This looks like most of us. Who thinks that the person is not free in their choice to stay or go? Just one. Why do you think? Still like figuring it out. Uh, okay. Let's see. I think I would say no, because whatever choice he made, the outcome would be the same. Good. So whatever choice the man in the basement makes, the outcome would be the same. So he chooses to stay in the basement. Um, and it's of his own volition that he does, right? However, if you were to make the alternative choice, he would still stay in the basement. So in either case, the, the choice makes no difference to the outcome. And so we think regardless of volition, he doesn't have the power to do otherwise, right? And without this ability to, to have a live option, right? The live option being like the actual capacity to leave the room, then his choice is not really a choice. Do you have a hand? But you have free will to choose how he spends the time in the basement, whether it's concocting a plan to somehow escape the locked basement or to freely choose to stay here and accept his fate and choose to spend his time otherwise. Right. So the, the comment here is, is well, he still has the, the free ability to like direct the own course of his actions, even if he's like stymied or stopped by the locked door, he still like tried to leave. And that's different from deciding to stay. Um, even if in deciding to stay for whatever reason, he jiggles the door handle or, or you know, performs some identical action to trying to leave, even though he doesn't ever intend to. So we might think that freedom has something really important to do with the uh, operation of choice. Um, it might have, and the operation of choice might have um, something essential built into it that has to do with consequences. It might have something to do with it, something actually existing or coming to exist in the world. 
and whether or not it possibly could, right? The live option idea. Um, or it could be that uh, our conception of a choice has more to do with something internal, not some state of affairs that could be or couldn't be, right? We're thinking of possibility, but rather um, what comes from us, the ability to, to think or desire, to volition, to um, think to myself, I make the choice to X. That's enough for a free choice. Um, okay, good. So here's a little bit of the, the conceptual space beginning to make itself clear and why freedom is a problem. Um, how about this one? Uh, the man is locked in the room and decides to leave, but can't. Is he free now? No, he's not free. Does anybody think he is free? Ethan Jennings thinks he's free. Ethan, you want to mind sharing? I think this analogy is stupid. I feel like he's got more than two choices. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so he could like choose to twiddle his thumbs or whatever. Um, let's say he's making the choice to leave the room or to stay. Is, is the choice itself free? Oh, I missed that. I don't know what you just said. So it's like, like excluding all other possibility space of choices, he's going to do one or the other. We're considering like the freedom of that particular choice. Um, he chooses to leave and the door is locked and he can't. Is the choice free or is he constrained, so to speak? We think he's not free. We think he's constrained, mostly. Well, the choice would still be free. The fact that he's constrained is an external thing. Right. So you might say the choice is free because, again, the intuition is that freedom is something that's internal rather than external. But the state of the world makes it impossible for that free choice to exercise itself in actu actuality. Good. So consistent intuitions. This is good. Um, what if uh, we now change the case because what we're doing is, is poking into um, like internal states of affairs and saying that uh, a free choice is one that accords with one's desires, right? How about the addict? So the addict is addicted to, you know, whatever drug um, and they desire to do it all the time. In fact, insofar as they do the drug all the time, it rebuilds brain pathways. Um, it creates a pharmacological necessity, right? To be without the drug is to literally die, right? Um, in some cases, uh, other cases just to get really sick. But say it's like, I don't know, Xanax. That's like a really easy one to get that lots of people get addicted to. It's out there. So, so what, what happens with Xanax addictions is um, Xanax uh, creates, uh, it, it inhibits one neurochemical that causes the, the like growth of another GABA is what it's called, um, such that if you stop taking Xanax completely after having taken it for like years and years or like lots for a, a shorter amount of time, um, the GABA that's in your brain won't be matched by the other chemical that's being suppressed. And then it becomes neurotoxic and you die, right? So this is like a real thing that, that can happen. So um, the, the Xanax addict, say, um, always chooses to take Xanax because they're addicted, right? And if they don't, then they'll die, sort of like the locked room. Is the choice due to addiction or coexistent with addiction? It's an internal choice. I like the Xanax addict desires the Xanax really badly because their body's saying like, I need this or else. Um, is that choice a free one to take the Xanax, the drug? Let's say yes. A free choice. I think initially. Um, before the addiction starts. Yeah, further into addiction, it becomes more of a habit, less of a free choice. But depending on how they're getting it, whether it's a prescription or not, they're making choices along the way to somehow get access to those. Right. So, so okay, this is good too. So the, the comment now is there uh, is a free choice at the beginning of the addiction, right? So like as soon as you start taking heroin, it's, you know, it's a free choice. But then once you're deep in the addiction, it's not a free choice anymore. Um, this is another important conceptual problem with free will, the difference between, say, something like moral responsibility and freedom. So we might say that uh, the addict is not morally responsible for their addiction because their choice 
is determined by their addiction. However, they are morally responsible sort of historically for having gotten into the mess, right? They made some bad choices and those choices were free and they could have done otherwise, but now that they're addicted, they, didn't, they, they can't. However, what's consistent um, is, is not the moral responsibility, that changes, right? Morally responsible at the beginning of the addiction, uh, not morally responsible in the midst of it. What changes is, um, or, or what doesn't change is the fact that the choice is always consistent with the desire. So the heroin addict or Xanax addict, whatever, desires the drug at the beginning and they're morally responsible and they still desire it when they're addicted, but they're not morally responsible anymore. So we have a choice consistent with desire, but it's this change in moral responsibility. So tracking what shifts conceptually, how do, how do we model that change? What are we supposed to make of it? Any ideas? What, like, you know, just like throwing it out there? Totally like, you know, hardball question. But, you know, what, what would you do to make the difference? It's a choice consistent with volition in both cases, but moral responsibility changes. Why? Brain chemistry for sure. Brain chemistry. Good. So we can be determined or we can, our freedom can be constrained by the powers of our brain. In some facet. In some facet. So finding the difference between uh, uh, neurological determinism and neurological freedom uh, is a tricky issue. Yeah, sure. I think, well, I think the addiction is what changes things, and like maybe addiction is sort of gradual, so it could be hard to find an exact point, but it's kind of like if you were doing your job or something, and then an armed gunman came in and was like, keep doing the same thing, like it's no longer your free choice and you're being forced to do it. Good, good. So this is getting into the, the idea of, of coercion, right? So we had constraint with the, the, the man locked in the room. Uh, as a constraint on freedom. And you might think that he's free or not, but we all agree that there's a constraint, the door is locked. Coercion is a different kind of defeater for our conceptions of free will. And you might think that whatever addiction is, it's a kind of coercion. It's like uh, like worm tongue whispering into Thaden's ear, turning him into like a crinkly old nasty person, right? Um, to, to not answer the call of, of, was it Rohan or whatever, um, Gondor. Yeah, Ryan's a different. He's from Rowan. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm a geek, but rusty on my nerdiness. Um, so constraint is something like the physical impossibility to to do otherwise. A coercion, on the other hand, say like with as opposed to the the Xanax addiction, where like you die if you don't do it. Um, heroin addiction isn't so dramatic. You just get really sick. Right? We've all seen train spotting, right? Um, with the freaky baby in the ceiling and he vomits every right? So when he's kicking the addiction, you just get really sick. So um, you're not constrained because you, you won't die if you stop taking, you just really don't want to do it. Um, similarly, uh, if a person has a gun to my head and says, keep doing what you're doing, I may really not want to keep doing it, but I don't want to do otherwise. I'm being coerced. I'm not being forced because I could stop. I'll just get shot, right? And that's not so great. So it's like lesser of two evils. I'd rather be coerced and do what I don't want to do. Um, and this is one of Cider's examples. So say like you get abducted and uh, someone uh, holds a gun to your head and says, pull the trigger and has you shoot like another hostage, right? Is that a free choice? Yes. It's a free choice. Anybody else? No, so here we have competing intuitions, right? That coercion can defeat free will um, or coercion uh, doesn't defeat free will, uh, but it probably, I would imagine, defeats moral responsibility. Depends on your values and, you know, how you can carry on. Like if I'm coerced, like gun to my head to shoot someone or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like valuing your own life. It, at, am I to be blamed for that? Depends if you want to die a martyr. In the, in the same sort of way that, say, like, if I freely chose to shoot somebody. Is there a difference in moral responsibility there? Um, 
Yeah, right. You know, decide if you don't have a gun to your head to shoot somebody and shoot them through it anyways. Yeah, so there's a difference in degree. Good. So, so what we're seeing now in this, in these different intuitions, um, with different degrees of moral responsibility or the fact of coercion defeating or not free choice, is different conceptions of freedom at play. So, what's bubbling up in you and what's bubbling up in you are two different um, ideas uh, or conceptions competing of what freedom is, and that's what we'll talk about today. Um, different conceptions of freedom and uh, possibilities of being without freedom. Let me think if I had any other cases in mind. Um, no. What, what aren't different? The, the degrees of morality. Or yeah, if you're like a moral nihilist or something, you'd think you're like a, um, you don't think that there is any such thing as uh, moral attitudes or normative states of affairs where you can't like evaluate one thing is better than another, uh, which is sort of a honestly boring position because um, it's it's a quietist one, right? If you're like completely, if you're absolutely skeptical um, or absolutely nihilistic, then there's no, there's nothing interesting to be said or to come from what you have to share because there's nothing to share because um, everything is equally um, negatively valued or without value. Um, and uh, there are some interesting therapeutic benefits to this, but at least in mapping out like conceptual space for something like free will, um, that's, you know, all that the radical skeptical view is always a uh, a possibility, it's always like open, right? And like Descartes, you know, there, there could be an evil genius or whatever, it's logically possible. Um, but uh, at least for getting at what we mean by freedom or how we understand it or how it's supposed to be operative in our everyday life, that kind of radical skepticism um, is typically unhelpful, right? Um, I, I think it's helpful to recognize, to like say like, look, we could be radically skeptical about this concept. And I'm like, great, we can. It's not a logically necessary concept is what we learned from that. Um, but logically, not a logically necessary concept is not terribly illuminative of how the concept is operative or any of that. So I think while skepticism has its therapeutic benefits and um, even has its benefits in analysis, uh, ought to be respected, though, like, quickly put to the side when we're engaging with, you know, ideas. Uh, Kyla. I was more going to ask, like, what if um, somebody had, like, a medical condition? Uh, yeah. Like, how would that be oh. handled? Good. Where, okay, so like, this... for example, like, somebody had a seizure while they were driving or something. Would they be blamed for the situation if they got in a car wreck mm -hmm. or something like that? Like, how would that be handled? Would they this be blamed? Yeah, would they be blamed for the situation because they didn't have necessarily like free will or control over the situation? Yeah, uh, it it reminds me of the the last thing that I did prepare as a thought experiment, but didn't remember until you brought it up. So thanks. So I think there's, personally, I think there's a difference between um, actions that we cause and actions that happen through us, right? Um, so uh, you might be say like stuck in traffic and really mad at the person in front of you because they're just like stopping and going, stopping and going, but it's not their fault that they're stopping and going, right? It's like the whole thing, it's the traffic that is causing that. but they're the person or a car or whatever that takes the, the brunt of your anger and whatever. Um, we all have bad days, right? Where we get short or irritated with people. And it's not really their fault. Um, it's more like what causes our irritation initially, bad sleep or stressful situations or whatever. And then, you know, they spell your name wrong in the Starbucks cup and your bad feelings aren't really their fault, but you know it happens through them. It's because of the wrong spelling. So I, I think, me personally, this is my own view, that um, moral responsibility is not attributable in the case of 
uh, actions happening through us, but only in the case of actions actions being caused by us. Um, and moral responsibility has to do with consequences, right? Real things in the world. Um, and we have to be in charge of those consequences. We have to sort of cause them. We have to bring them about, right? There's a difference between someone putting a gun to my head and saying, shoot this person and me just shooting a person or having a seizure on the highway and crashing my car into, you know, four other cars or just deciding to flip the wheel, you know, yeet, here we go, right? There's a difference in moral, in moral responsibility there. Um, and the difference seems to be in the degree or really just fact of if at all, um, my causing that action, right? So freedom is, is what has to be present in order for me to like have that causal relationship in order to, to say that I'm morally responsible in the one case and not in the other. And if we don't have a concept of freedom, then how do we get a concept of moral responsibility assuming that there is a difference in these kinds of cases? So freedom is really important for um, even our everyday conceptions of like good and bad. Like how do we say like, okay, you caused that, but what, what do we mean when we say that, right? Um, so here's the last thought experiment to do with this. Um, recidivism in the justice system. So recidivism is like going back to jail. You like commit a crime and then you keep committing a crime. You're a recidivist. Um, like if you've seen Reno 911, Big Mike, right, right, is a recidivist. He keeps getting arrested over and over. Um, and so there is a bunch of research on the uh, neurochemistry of recidivism. Um, uh, and, and do you guys know Radio Lab? Yeah, it's like this cool podcast through NPR. Um, they did one on this guy who had like a traumatic brain injury, which deleted his impulse control, and he got way into child pornography. He didn't want to, but like his impulse control was just dead, right? Like he couldn't tell himself no. Uh, and so he, because he has no impulse control, like just does it, right? Um, and eventually gets picked up and put in jail. But he didn't do it before the traumatic brain injury, right? He had impulse control before. Uh, and he, like, you know, the cops show up and he just immediately, like, I know I've, I've done wrong. I can't help it. I can't say no to myself um, because of this lesion in his brain. Uh, is this person morally, it, 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 did this person choose to break the law? Are, are they the same sort of offender? as uh, say like your normal, normal child pornography viewer, whatever, or is there a difference in these cases? It's like the, the neurophysical makeup of one's brain affects what we think about moral and maybe not legal, but at least moral responsibility. I mean, like the guy still went to jail and did time. Um, so with recidivists in general, there are, um, there's research on like neurological correlates that the more you go to jail, the more you commit crimes, the more likely you're to do it. So um, let's, let's change the case a little bit. Let's say it's not this person who has like a brain lesion that deletes their impulse control. Let's say that it's someone who grew up with uh, an abusive father and a neglectful mother that beat the hell out of them as, as a kid. And uh, um you know, drunk and away or whatever, right? Just like abusive. Um, and this person grows up uh, and starts a cult and murders a famous director's wife and then carves a swastika on his forehead. The Charles Manson, right? So Charles Manson maybe could have been a perfectly normal kid, right? Had he been with perfectly normal parents, but he was incredibly abused. So this conditions him to be an abusive person. What would you say about Jeffrey Dahmer? He grew up with like a normal type of person. Besides the fact that he's frightening? I don't know. Um, so in the case of recidivism, in the case of being conditioned over time, not just like with a lesion, right? Like boom, you hit your head, no impulse control. So you start committing crimes. Like that's unfortunate, right? like put the person in jail because they broke the law and perpetuated an awful thing, right? Um, but we treat it as like, that, that sucks, right? Um, sort of a bummer. Why there was a podcast on Radio Lab about it. Um, but in the case of Charles Manson, conditioned over time, grew up that way. There was no one event that can be traced to, but a history of events, 
um, that we still say is unfortunate, but do we think that he's free in his choice or is he determined by the circumstances of his childhood? I think he's still free. However, the conditioning over time through historical tragic events makes the pathway to negative actions is easier rather than just the course of one life. Interesting. So the comment is that uh, Charles Manson is still free and deciding to murder cult people. Uh, but he is more likely to do it than to not. So his freedom is coerced or constrained, but not completely, not like a locked door, sort of just like mostly, right? Like the door is kind of jammed and you really got to push if you want to get out, if you don't want to murder cult people. Um, this is another interesting sort of conception of freedom, that freedom can come in degree. Maybe it's not a give or take one or the other, right? It's, it, it could be scalar. You could be more or less free. Um, another interesting idea. So this, again, all of these thought experiments are supposed to sort of like press your intuitions to give you a sense of why freedom as a concept is not as uh, intuitive as we think, right? It's just like, we make choices every day. We decide to go to the store. We decide to come to class. We decide to drink water, text on our phones. And it all feels like I did it. We did it, right? Um, and then when we drill deeper into that, I did it, we did it, uh, things start to get kind of weird. It can happen in degree. It can be uh, defeated, uh, maybe only in part by coercion or um, uh, constraint. It can be, uh, freedom can be more or less correlative with moral responsibility based on, say, like neurological conditions or conditions of the world. Um, Right, being forced to, to do something or being unable to stop ourselves from do, doing something. Uh, and so these are all of the issues that make free will an interesting philosophical problem that now I'll share my screen and we will discuss and get into. Perfect. Okay, so we already jumped into it and we already did this. Uh, good. Okay, so why is free will important? Well, as we chatted about, as we just discussed, it's determin determinations of responsibility. How we say if someone is at fault or not, or um, if they're praiseworthy or not. Um, it, I used all negative cases, but you could say the same thing about say like a, an altruist, someone could have some neurological condition that makes them give everything away. Um, or be like incredibly kind, uh, but it's because of their neurological condition. Are they actually praiseworthy in the same sort of way that someone without the same condition uh, would be praiseworthy if, if they made the same choices? How do we determine the difference? Um, and this, this difference uh, comes into practical effect in the legal arena. So when we're talking about freedom uh, as a practical concept that has real implications for people's actual lives and really for the rest and all of them um, is in the court of law. Um, and also for moral philosophers and, and uh, moral considerations as well. There are also metaphysical considerations like what is the, the world? If, if we are free, um, what about the world? What, what is freedom? Like, so I can say that I have an arm, but, and I have a leg and I can point to those things. But if I say I have freedom, what am I pointing at, right? Um, what sort of world is it that makes it possible for me to be free or to not be free? And similarly, what is the self? So um, what I do is determinative of who I am, right? Why I do what I do is determinative of who I am. That this question of identity of human nature being good or bad, or like, am I, who am I? What am I? Do I have a self? Um, this is very much wrapped up in free will as well. How I choose to exercise my free will um, or how it's exercised on me um, hooks into this question of identity as well. So we're seeing sort of this, the, the net of philosophical issues of, of this course sort of begin to construct itself, that everything is connected, right? 
So we'll talk about the legal and moral case first. This is, does, does anybody know who this is? No. Does anybody know Scopes Monkey? No? Do you not learn this anymore? Did it teach you in like English or social science? No? Is it like Scopes Monkey, the evolution debate in schools? No. Well, Clarence Darrow is one of America's most famous orators and lawyers, incredibly fun, maybe not anymore. <laughs> uh, it's the Scopes Monkey trial lawyer, look it up. It's hugely influential for um, education in general. Um, and in 1924, defends Leopold and Leob of murder charges. These guys, this is a super famous case, maybe not anymore, um, but was like, it, it took America by storm, this case. So, so these two brothers were child prodigies, incredibly brilliant kids uh, who were taken with Nietzsche's concept of the Ubermensch, the Superman, right? Um, and they totally misinterpreted Nietzsche as you might as, as a young person who doesn't have the capacity to read Nietzsche with the sort of philosophical sensitivity that you need to read Nietzsche well. Um, and think that uh, what Nietzsche is recommending is to be uh, the greatest person you must exert your will as you desire it, right? The will to power, do what you will and, and be powerful in it. Um, this is like the Naziist appropriation of Nietzsche that's completely wrong. Um, that is actually a result of Nietzsche's sister was like a proto-Nazi um, and she took care of Nietzsche when he had his mental break. Uh, and reorganized all of his notebooks and made him famous, but also re reorganized his notebooks to be consistent with her like political message, which is not what Nietzsche was interested in. In fact, he was like way against the sort of fascist. Ideas. Anyways, um, this was not known uh, until much later in 1924. This was still like the going view of Nietzsche. And so these two young boys, very brilliant, pick up a Nietzsche book and think, well, in order to be the, the most powerful uh, person in, in the world, the sort of person who determines world history and, and makes uh, their will the, the law of the universe, uh, I must do what I must do and make my will the law of the universe. And so they decide um, that they were human superiors and uh, so above the law. And they abducted and killed a 14 year old boy, one of their classmates um, as an expression of their power. They thought that they were smart enough and powerful enough to get away with it. And this was just a test of the truth of their belief that they were these um, will to power Uber mentioned, right? Um, they get caught. And as Clarence Darrow says, this terrible crime was inherent in his organism and it came from some ancestor. Is any blame attached because somebody took Nietzsche's philosophy seriously and fashioned his life upon it? It is hardly fair to hang a 19 year old boy for the philosophy that was taught him at the university, right? So he's at the University of Chicago. He hears a professor talk about Nietzsche. And so he decides that, okay, uh, I, I think Nietzsche's right. I should go kill somebody, which is misinterpretation. But regardless, uh, this is the argument. Right, that it's not the boy's fault; it's the fault of the lecture, of the content, of this ancestor, of this teaching of Nietzsche. Right, and the verdict: not guilty, at least of first-degree murder. They they spent life in jail, um, but the argument was successful that uh, these boys were coerced. They were uh, uh, the the lessons caused them, rather than they caused themselves to commit this terrible, heinous crime. And so they get off of um, the death penalty. Now, the reason that Clarence Darrow in particular chooses this case and it becomes so famous is uh, his arguments aren't just that the, the cause of the action is external to the, the people themselves, but uh, that argument was part and parcel of a larger program to uh, get rid of the uh, death penalty and capital punishment because he was way against killing people uh, like as a state. State sanctioned murder is not cool, according to Clarence Darrow. Uh, and so this was his argument to say, look, like if we're uh, sanctioning the, the death penalty, then we're committing people to death for things that they're not responsible for because the causes are outside of them and that's not cool. And that's usually the case. So we shouldn't be doing this in general. And it convinced his audience, the jury. 
Uh, so Darrow argues that capital punishment is immoral and gives several reasons. First among them is that responsibility for crime cannot be drawn so closely to the identity of a person. Right. We might, in supporting capital punishment, think that retribution is uh, the right way to treat crime, that we uh, don't just rehabilitate, but in cases where things are extreme enough, we use retribution. We, we eye for an eye, right? poke them both out. Um, and uh, Darrow disagrees. He thinks that retribution is unjustified because on, uh, in order to justify retribution, you'd have to place responsibility in the, the criminal, the recidivist or whatever. Um, and that cannot be done uh, as is the case with these boys who are taught the lesson and that's why they committed the murder, not because they wanted to, uh, at least they might've wanted to, but uh, the, the degree of responsibility is not great enough on that desire or contingent on that desire uh, without the external cause as well, the lesson that they learned. Um, and the idea here is just that we're products of our environment. Uh, causes for our behaviors live outside of us. Uh, we don't always choose uh, completely freely. We're sometimes coerced, sometimes doors are locked, sometimes guns are to our head, right? Um, but how can we be to blame if we're not blameworthy, if we're not the source of our actions? Or how do we measure right, the degree of causal sourcedness in our actions such that we can likewise measure degree of praise and blameworthiness? Well, a lot of this question has to do with what we are, right? What is in us that causes or is able to cause action or is in the course of causation? Um, and so you might say that I'm a bundle of impressions. I don't really control anything in this case. I just am a sponge of perception. You might say I'm a series of memories. Um, that I'm a series of memories that feels like I had some sort of causal force in, in being present through those memories, or uh, I am what I care about, right? The perfect case, I am my physical form. What all of these notions of identity share in common? Well, a singular sense of self inhabiting one um, or some of these criteria. And it's this self thing that is what's supposed to cause, right? It's the self that is in all of us that we're attributing moral praise and blame to, that we're attributing freedom of choice or not to. And so freedom is a kind of cause um, it, uh, created by this self. And it leads to our acting, um, or at least to our participating in the world if um, we're not free or if we're coerced or whatever, constrained. And how we participate in the world makes us who and what we are. So freedom is, again, constitutive of identity. So for instance, the dude abides, right? He reacts to the world. He just goes with the flow. Doesn't seem to be choosing anything. Let's get back my carpet, man, right? Yeah, yeah, really tied the room together. He doesn't make any choices in that movie. He just floats along and wild stuff happens to him. And uh, Walter fights back, cocks his gun and says, hot oh, damn. I don't want to like take charge of this situation. Shut up, Donnie, right? Um, and then the nihilist, right? Even the German nihilist who doesn't take part in the world at all differently from the dude, he just, you know, floats with his bottle of Jack Daniels or whatever it is, um, still participates in the world implicitly through omission, right? So in uh, Catholicism, there's a difference in kinds of sin. There's sin by omission and sin by commission, where sin by commission is like you shot the guy, that's your sin. Um, sin by omission might be you were a bystander and you didn't stop the person from shooting the guy. So the different degrees and kinds of sin, but the similar idea of moral responsibility here, at least like identity and action participating um, through an agent. So the nihilist doesn't go with the flow so much or take control so much, but just sort of omits. And this is a kind of um, choice uh, constitutive of the kind of person that they are. So freedom uh, is sometimes about what we choose to do, what we fail to choose, and how we choose, right? This is what makes us who we are. And so if freedom is the source of our choice, then it's also the wellspring of identity, and this is what makes it so important. Freedom is important. It's a central locus of questions concerning identity, ethics, and justice, but do we have it, right? So as Sider says, Freedom seems to conflict with a series, with, with a certain apparent fact. And this is like our scientific intuitions, the way that we think about the world scientifically. 
Incredibly, this fact is no secret. Most people are fully aware of it. We uncritically accept free will only because we fail to put two and two together. The problem of free will is a time bomb hidden within our most deeply held beliefs. And here's the fact. Every event has a cause. Okay, so every event has a cause is the simplest way of putting the principle of sufficient reason. This is what it's called in the, the history of philosophy through the history of philosophy. The principle of sufficient reason is an axiom of most, if not all, rational thinking. The uh, only case that famously denies the principle of sufficient reason uh, is Lewis Carroll in um, the Achilles and the tortoise going back and forth. Um, which is another fun thing to Wikipedia on your own time. So um, principle of sufficient reason is the basis of not just like scientific thinking, it's sort of like an abstract theoretical level, but like actual empirical working in the world. When the, the uh, bus is hurtling at 45 miles an hour down the road, I assume that if I walk in front of it, it's going to hit me and I'm going to die or get seriously injured right? That there is an event for which there's an effect and a cause, right? And for every event that happens, there's a reason why it happens. The bus is hurtling at 45 miles an hour because the driver is stepping on the gas, because combustion happens in the engine, uh, because certain pressures and uh, fire and vacuum create pistons shooting up and down and carburetors and stuff if it's an old bus. Um, so what we get is this explanation-based reality on the principle of sufficient reason, right? So why are we here? Because we are here, we walked here, or we are sitting here, we click the YouTube link, right? Um, that explains why we're here. Um, and every event in the world has a reason. Name, name one that doesn't, can anybody? No? The Big Bang, good. So you might say the very first one, but everything else after that, yeah. Good, so the Big Bang in our domino case here might be the first little finger push of the dominoes, but the dominoes are all lined up. However the Big Bang happens, sets into course, what will follow it? And this is the principle known as determinism. Okay, so our principle of sufficient reason is accepted. So we'll just like assume it's true. And after assuming it's true, we say, okay, what does this commit us to? It commits us to a worldview that is deterministic. If every event that has happened, will happen, and is happening has a cause that sufficiently explains that event and why it happened, then everything is explained. Everything is uh, written right? Uh, like the dominoes, um, no. like the dominoes, if they're all set up and I push the first one, we know it's going to happen to the last one, right? It's going to fall over, right? And the reason it falls over is because the one before that falls over, because the one before that falls over, et cetera, all the way back to say like the very beginning, Big Bang. Um, and this is like proof one for God is the first mover, right? We'll talk about that in a few weeks, but spoiler. Um, so determinism is just the, the, the commitment that comes on the basis of our scientific worldview, that we can explain stuff. And just to, to say why I'm calling it a scientific worldview, in science, in, empirical, in the empirical world where we gather data from the world, we measure, we model and measure the world and its phenomena. And then we infer on the basis of strong correlation causation. We say, well, every time uh, an object is dropped, uh, its acceleration can be measured by 9.81 meters per second, every time. Um, and we say that it's accelerative force downwards towards the center of mass or of gravity um, is uh, caused by the fact of gravity um, or the, the law of gravity as it is. Um, and so what we're doing is taking phenomena and explaining why those phenomena are uh, using principles of sufficient reason, right? We're just thinking through the world. This is what causes this. 
And if we all agree that this is how the world works, then maybe we're committed to a deterministic worldview. And what does this do to freedom? If the world is determined, what does this do to freedom? So before we answer that question, let's do a thought experiment. So here's Superman. Let's imagine, for instance, that Superman is real, which is really disappointing because he's the lamest superhero. He just like is perfect. Okay, great. There's, there's like one guy on the planet without hair uh, with like one rock that stops him and that's it. Yeah, boring. Superhero with character. So Superman spins the world and the world goes backwards. And for whatever reason, this is supposed to turn back time. And if Superman is real, then so can the fact of his spinning around the world fast enough to turn back time. Just, I don't get it, but this is what the writers came up with. Uh, and the world goes back in time, 65 million years. Here we are in what's probably the Triassic. Um, looks like a dimetrodon with the bill thing, which I think is Triassic. Um, and this apparently happens in the comic books. He goes back to the dinosaur time, 65 million years in the past, looking at him flying and punching the tooth out of a Tyrannosaurus Rex without feathers. They have feathers. Okay. So the question, the world has been spun back 65 million years. Does world history happen exactly as it did? Does every event that occurred reoccur? Who, who, thinks, who thinks yes? That whatever happened the last time 65 million years passed to get us to here, when Superman spins the world back, it happens again. Not if he punches the dinosaur in the face. Yeah, you kick a rock and then all of a sudden this becomes intro to statistics. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. It's a philosophy class. I'm being uncareful. Delete Superman 65 million years ago. Does it all happen the same way? Yes. No. Who says no? Does anybody online say no? No. Nobody online says no. And nobody online says anything. <laughs> Laugh at my jokes though. You say no. The world happens differently second time around. Um, I think the possibility of it happening differently. It could. Is there. Little things might change. Yeah, because I, I think with the ability of free will, um, let's say Alexander the Great, you know, didn't have his conquest because it, instead of um, going towards that that profession, you know, something else happened. He, he fell and, and broke his arm in the middle of a great battle one day. That, that has a whole domino effect of, of things happening in the future. Right. Or somebody else takes his place and, and he becomes, you know, the great. Right. So, so again, similar principle here, like if Superman punches the teeth out of the dinosaur that didn't have its teeth punched out before, then different stuff happens right? because we're changing the course of history. So it seems like the, the intuition is that the course of history could change, that it's not written. So given the way that the world is set up 65 million years ago, uh, you could say uh, predict um, in the short term uh, what's going to happen. You could like, like you could measure a ball rolling down a hill similar sort of thing. Um, but in the long term, enough little micro changes happen to create a new present. Yeah, I don't know how drastically it would change though. I just think it wouldn't happen exactly the same way. Okay. So there's no micro stuff that in black mirror in the past year where you can see all the algorithms that you can have the output to what you can do in the Like when you talk about baseball players like James Bond and how that actually plays the point that there's no shock Yeah. So you might think like Back to the Future is another example. You know, if Biff finds the betting book, then the world becomes Biff world. But if he doesn't, it goes back to just as it was, mostly. Um, uh, if somebody like goes back in time, how can you say that they weren't predetermined to do that? And yeah, so this is the problem. Okay, again, I was being uncareful with the Superman theme, being dramatic, trying to make it fun. Uh, but also a good point. I mean, as long as we're talking about like flipping the world back and determinism and stuff, uh, you might say that there's a kind of recursion uh, and that 
that like Superman always did go backwards and then the world will just like go back to the point that Superman goes backwards and then it, like recurs that way it should be weird um it's also a strange problem with like time travel movies and time travel in general in Hollywood film one movie that does it really well is called Looper it's totally weird and freaky and you got to watch it like eight times to to get it or watch like with some YouTube dude doing commentary over it which can be irritating but you know it's it's a cool movie that I think does time travel well um but let's say like no Superman going back in time um is it physically possible for the world to change course if it's exactly as it was 65 million years ago is it physically possible at all for things to happen differently or does it all just happen the same way I would argue yes only because people do regardless of how their life is structured whether we believe in determinism or not or free will or not at the end they still have the free will to make small decisions that have a great impact sure okay so the intuition that the world wouldn't happen the same way or isn't necessarily to happen the same way is called indeterminism. Now, the issue with indeterminism is that it has gone from the principle of sufficient reason, right? So if we give up the principle of sufficient reason or limit it in some way, then there's a whole big burden of proof and argument and modeling to explain how that's possible, right? Um, and you could say some like probability theory stuff with quantum mechanics, maybe. Um, but even then, uh, as Sider describes it, even if the world is indeterministic in this way, that things could happen differently, we may still not get free will. However, if you have the intuition that, yes, it, like science says balls roll down hills based on gravity and whatnot, and the natural laws of the, the world and the universe uh, persist just as well 65 million years ago as they do now. They're the same laws. And so everything is measurable. So in the same sort of way that uh, we can tell a, a story, like we can draw the geological record and say like how sediment packed on itself and you know when there were rivers here and what sort of geological events occurred. We can tell a story going backwards in time, um, given the evidence uh, that present 65 million years ago has in it all of the features that would give us that story going forward as well, you're a determinist. So either as an indeterminist or as a determinist, we're gonna run into problems with conceiving of free will and making space for it. So Noah Belknap says, I think it has to do with what Sider said about Hitler. If you had 1 million of Hitlers, there's a chance it could change. That's exactly right, Noah. And it's also exactly why uh, I maintain that philosophers should not be given NIH grants because we will create 1 million Hitlers and see what happens just for the sake of modeling free will. Um, okay, so if you said no, you're either an indeterminist or not yet convinced of determinism, you're confused about the principle of sufficient reason and how it works. Um, or if you said yes, then you're a determinist, right? So we're not for free will, this would be the most reasonable position, again, because every event has a cause by the principle of sufficient reason. Determinism is reasonable because we've all seen science succeed in the search for the underlying cause of things. Science does well, and it continues to do well. It gets confused, and it needs uh, paradigm shifts in order to re-understand itself in the world, but it is shifting, and uh, we think trending towards truth or more complete conception of reality in the world, uh, and uh, our best evidence gets better, right? And we might expect that given sufficient time, scientific progress will discover the causes of everything. We will complete science, just as we might complete mathematics. Science maps out the causal connections of physical objects. And the first domino is pushed. What happens is this one, it falls, right? Because all of the others were set up that way. Um, and if we get smart enough and uh, intricate enough in our scientific methods, then why shouldn't we be able to um, see into the future, just as we can uh, measure where a ball is going to end up based on the friction and acceleration of the, and the angle of the ramp or whatever that it falls down. Um, that's a toy and baby example, but more complex systems um, should, in principle, the principle of sufficient reason that is, be consistent with the same uh, sort of idea that we could see them out in the future. So what counts as a source of causation that science can predict? Well, the brain. The brain causes stuff, doesn't it? 
makes it's what we use to decide things. It's where thoughts happen. Well, the Aristotle and the Greeks thought that thinking happened here in the chest and the heart region, not in the head. And it makes me, as like a side note, and this, I don't know if this is silly or not, but sometimes I try to like think from a different part of my body. Maybe it's like a meditative exercise or something. Like, can I think from my feet? Is that possible to source? Because it like this, what, what I am is like so much sourced in my head, so almost like naturally. Um, but does it need to be, or is it just like a power of imagination that I could think from my foot or something? Um, it's a curious idea because historically there's precedent for thought coming from other parts of us, yeah? I think there's a parallel to the Greek version of that, like some kind of erotic ideas that like that. Yeah. Good. So you might say that intelligence can be embodied um, to go with the side note. We'll talk about this uh, when I do my lecture on flow states and happiness. Um, that, that's what I research. It's what I'm writing my dissertation on is expertise and the embodiment of knowledge and creativity and stuff. Um, so I, I think it's a really fascinating area. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, like, you, I suppose you think of things like thinking regions as like holes, like holes within the thinking organ of your brain. But if you didn't know that, like, good so we're we're we think that the head is where thoughts come from because we're told that um it's kind of a determination right that a cause outside of us makes us the way that we are determinism so the brain is the way yeah the center of perception the collection of uh, environmental data that is then constructed and interpreted into reality um, is mostly from this part of the body. Sure. Okay. So interesting, but for a future week, to get back to free will. All right. So your brain is a physical object, just like everything else, right? Like uh, I can measure the, how fast this will fall if I know its weight and the distance to the ground. Um, and my brain is a physical object determined by the very same natural laws, the very same laws of the world and cosmos. Everything is bound up in the same system, right? Natural order. Uh, so why shouldn't I be able to, like predicting how my clicker drops, be able to predict how the brain works if I have an intricate and uh, complex enough uh, system of uh, modeling and interpretation? So if all science can predict ac accurately the causal relations of all physical objects, it should be able to do so for the brain as well. Just like in lesion studies, we can say that if this part of your brain is broken, it causes you to be unable to recognize faces, right? Aphasia or whatever it's called. Um, science maps out the cause of uh, connections of physical objects through natural law. Um, but your brain is you, right? So. You're in class and excited to participate, I hope. Um, and you may have decided to come to class and feel this decision is uh, a cause that you controlled. You decided to do it and it was your decision. You might think that. But what about how you brushed your teeth this morning or how you rolled over in bed on hearing your alarm? These more basic, natural, habituated motions, they're still actions, but are they the same sort of action? Do they rise to the level of causal choice, um, even if you didn't decide to do it explicitly? Not all of your behavior is conscious and introspection is an imperfect tool for determining self-caused behavior. Sometimes we do things and we can't report why, especially experts. Um, even so, what helped you to decide to come to class at all? What did you use? Not your car or your web browser. Analysis. The, your brain, yeah. Where, where does that happen is in, in your head, right? Neurons fire, stuff happens. The zeros go to ones and the ones go to zeros and you think oh, I should show up to class, right? So if it's your brain and your brain is a physical object that is determined by natural law is, and, and it's also where choice happens, is your choice likewise determined by natural law? Could we measure choice on the basis of physical interactions? Um, if you're a determinist, you probably think something like yes. So here's the, the formal expression of determinism. Um, you have some causes going back ad infinitum, uh, leading to the next cause, and the next cause, and the next cause. Um, I exist because my parents existed, because their parents existed, because they. So another interesting concept is the genetic isopoint. There's a period at which, in the past, every living human is your relative, 
uh, which I think is something like 2000 BC for um, everybody. And then for uh, Anglo-Saxon, like European descent people, it's much later. So it's like around Charlemagne, so like 1000 AD or so, 500 AD, something like that. Genevieve's point. Um, so anyways, determinism just says there's causes going all the way back up uh, to you know where the big bang started things. Um, leading to decision, which leads to an effect, principle of sufficient reason says that all of this can be sufficiently measured and explained. So to give this some uh, uh, body, we might say that the uh, effect is the invasion of Poland. This is Sider's example, right? World War II. Um, the decision is like, I'm gonna invade Poland, blitzkrieg, right? Um, so the cause of the decision is to desire the land mass that is Poland. Um, cause one is maybe something Hitler's advisor said, like you should probably take Poland if you wanna own all of Europe and the world. Um, and the reason that Hitler agrees that this is a good reason to take Poland is because he was kicked out of art school and he's real mad about you know, the, the Jews or whatever, um, right? So like the, the structure of, of his upbringing and his interaction with the world leads him to think certain things which cause him eventually to invade Poland. And we can map out all of these causes deterministically going back and back and back and back. So where does the buck stop and how does it stop? What are we to do about this problem, right? It's similar to the problem of the regression of justification that we have this ad infinitum regression of causes. We might say, um, well, at some point, somebody decides something and it can't be explained. It's indeterministic. Something that can't be measured stops the buck. Um, but you might say that it goes on forever, right? If you say it goes on forever, a hard determinist is going to bite the bullet. This problem doesn't matter to me, says the hard determinist. Very simply, uh, they deny that free will exists. It's merely a necessary illusion. So this is why it's like hard determinism as opposed to soft. Um, there is no free will. Free will is impossible and physical determination is true. Everything can be mapped out sufficiently and this makes free will impossible. People are not morally responsible for their actions. How could they be? They don't cause them. They're, the causes date far before them. The reason you are is because of the genetic I point Adam and Eve, whatever people um, dating all the way back and you are not in control of anything. You are just a domino in the chain of things. There are no unnecessary, unwritten, non-destined non events uh, that occur. And all is known in the whole that must and always will be, right? This is kind of a monism. Everything is and will be and must be, and there's no alternatives, hard determinism, right? But alternatively, in sort of the opposite um, direction, we could be libertarians and not libertarians in the like uh, neoliberal, let's, you know, like make the world all about markets and value and shoot your guns and smoke your pot and that libertarian. Libertarianism is a term of art in philosophy, uh, especially free will, um, specifically to do with um, the uh, radical conception of freedom being consistent with whatever the world is, right? So whatever we think that we are when we freely choose to do things from sort of a naive folk conception of freedom is the real thing. And it's, it's actually going on and screw determinism, right? So libertarianism scoffs at the problem of causes. Determinism is surely false. We don't have to worry about this infinite regression of causes because there's no such thing as an infinite regression of causes. I have free will and I can determine to change the course of history. Uh, I can fly around the world and punch a dinosaur in the tooth, or, you know, whatever. Um, I have what's called libertarian free will. It's like robust and frankly mysterious form of free will. And although our best science does a great job, humans are special. Science can measure and map out things, but we got something else going on and that's free will. But what is freedom for the libertarian? What does it mean to be free in a world that can also be measured scientifically? Well. The libertarian says it's agent causation. Uh, there's something in us, humans, that allows us to decide and choose. Um, but even if there is something in us that allows us to decide and choose, we might run into problems. And this is where Sider talks about quantum mechanics and probabilities. So for instance, uh, randomness. Imagine Mother Teresa, uh, surprised, finds a grenade in her hand. And then even more surprised, finds herself pulling the pin and throwing it into a group of children. There's no cause for this action, it just happens. And she's like, oh my God, what? No, but it's happening, right? Um, 
there's no cause for this action. Um, this is a completely random event, right? Um, this is no good for freedom if randomness is invited into the system of empirical determinism, right? So we say that determinism is false because the world is random. Uh, because in cases where uh, we say that freedom is, is a random event, it's like the Mother Teresa thing. There's no cause, but it seems like freedom is an operative in the way that we want it to be. That we can say, well, she threw a grenade and that's you know, like, she caused that. She didn't, it just like happened through her, right? Um, so if randomness is the source of agent causation, that doesn't seem enough to be uh, constitutive of free will. Um, because what we want is not just a break in determination which randomness would give us, but we also want a uh, actual like agent-centered identity related reason to explain why uh, something happened. But we could also say that uh, there's mechanistic issues. Um, so uh, a mechanism sort of idea, meaning that like uh, uh, my choices are based on a belief desire pair that I believe that eating a sandwich will uh, make me not hungry anymore. I desire to not be hungry, therefore I eat a sandwich. We might say that there's kind of this mechanistic explanation of desires and beliefs and how they fit together and when they fit together right, it causes me to do things. But I don't control my beliefs. My beliefs are like, you know, they happen to me. I don't control my desires. They happen to me too. I get hungry. I, don't, I didn't decide to get hungry. And I didn't choose to believe one thing or another. Maybe like the evidence that got presented to me seems strong enough to cause me to think this way. And I might reason about a series of, of beliefs to come to some conclusion, but why I reason in the way in which I do, all of this is sort of taught to me. It's, it's developed through me. So we say that agent causation is just the right pairing of beliefs and desires. That doesn't get us the sort of like, you did it, right? You're in charge. You threw the grenade, Mother Teresa. Um, it still sort of sources, outsources, that like causal moral responsibility connection of freedom to something that is mechanistic and not in us. So what sort of thing is agent causation if it cannot be so mechanistic as being explained by belief desire pair, like what you want, um, or as spontaneous as random deliverances of action? It's unclear. Agent causation is a mysterious thing. Um, and you might also think that agent causation is like a subversion of science that, and, and this is like, if you're a determinist, um, most libertarians probably aren't gonna worry about this, but they're gonna have to, given that the objectors are gonna say, well, you're eschewing the principle of sufficient reason, that's a problem for me, right? You said that you can't control your beliefs, you can't control like the way that your thought process is happening because of who you are and genetics. But you mean, you can make the argument that you can change your beliefs by searching for evidence that you Free yeah. So, so again, what sources the capacity to um, restructure one's beliefs and desires? Uh, something like agent causation, and and it, like the problem that I noted earlier, I can point to my leg and I can point to my arm, but can I point to the thing that agent causes stuff? The like mysterious entity, the floaty thing somewhere in me that um, makes it possible me for possible for me to supersede the physical mechanistic conditions of my being um, to self-determine in one particular way or another, it gets more problematic. So libertarians say like, yeah, we're free, but I don't really know what that means. It's like whatever we kind of make of it, right? So if you're not happy with hard determinism because it's too hardcore, and if you don't like libertarianism because it's too spooky, you might find yourself um, being a hard incompatibilist. So you could say determinism is false. Uh, like, right? If we spin the world back, it'll happen differently, right? Because alternatives are possible, right? Um, but free will is also impossible because of this, right? That the world is indeterministic, but that doesn't make me free just because there's randomness invited in the situation or capacity for alternatives, power to do otherwise. The world could happen elsewise. Um, this does not make me free. So the world in this case would be random. So say like my brain is a bunch of random firings, neurons going off. They could be ones, they could be zeros. Uh, and it's just a matter of chance that they're one way or another and I decide to be the way that I am. 
randomness, again, outsources that central cause that we're looking for that's related to identity that, that we like mean when we say, I decided to go to the store, I decided to come to class, I decided to, um, uh, you, you know, like give away all my inheritance to the, the poor people of some country, right? Um, there's something about you that matters and randomness outsources the, the thing that matters in freedom when we care about it. Um, and so if you're in incompatibilist, you can deny, you can deny determinism, but still not um, have a, a proper conception of free will. Free will is impossible, um, but determinism is also false, the hard incompatibilists. And if you think that quantum mechanics is a thing, like the world is determined by probabilities, this is just one interpretation of quantum mechanics, maybe not the best one, but the prevailing one. Um, you might say that the world is just a matter of probabilities. This is a bunch of probability clusters. Uh, so if you have particular hydrogen atoms uh, with uh, different valences, meaning different numbers of electrons surrounding them, uh, the more or less electrons surrounding them, the more likely they'll be uh, in one of these positions. So these are sort of like heat maps of where the electrons could be. Uh, they're not actual like measurements of where the electrons are because you can't know both the speed and location of a quantum object uh, completely. Like they're anti-correlative. This is Schrodinger's law. Um, so you might say that the world is something like this. It's just a bunch of probabilities uh, and so determinism is false because any of the probabilities could happen, but what determines them is random. Not we decide to do one thing or another, but randomness decides with a frequency of say like 90% or 10% in the alternative, right? Okay. So here's like a map of probabilities. There's a 95% chance I come to class, a 4.9% chance that I blow it off, and a 0.1% chance that I quit my job entirely and you know, like have a breakdown and uh, move to Mexico. Um, so once the probabilities are set, they're still kind of deterministic, but what causes one over the other is indeterministic. So roll the world back 65 million years ago, uh, 9.5 times out of 10, uh, I'll come to class today. And 4.9 times out of 10, I won't, right? So you might say that it's random, that what makes the difference between these different possible worlds, this still doesn't give us freedom. So hard indeterminism, incompatibilism, right? Yep. Yeah. So if there was a flat percent chance for everything, wouldn't the future be drastically different? That's something you so the future would be different. And this is to say, um, again, that determinism is false, right? That there, there's an incompatibility between free will and determinism uh, and both are false, right? So uh, you're hard in determinism as compared to your hard determinism, which would say that there's no probabilities. Everything's written. It, it all just will be again as it was, as it was and will continue to be. Um, so the, the in, incompatibilist says, yeah, determinism is false, but so is free will as well. Um, things will happen as they will randomly, but it doesn't give us that, again, agent-centered sort of cause. So there's one final possibility. Oh, and this is based on a certain view of probability. If you're interested in probability, this is a huge philosophical problem. Um, I recommend uh, uh, Jonas Schubach's inductive logic course, where you learn to do inductive logic and measure probabilities. Um, but you also uh, do it through the lens of like what probabilities are metaphysically. Like is a probability a frequency? Is it something subjective that we determine? Is it out there in the world? Right? Interesting question. So if you're, if you like math and numbers and philosophy, cool class. So what we've looked at is hard incompatibilism or kind of indeterminism. We've seen libertarianism and hard determinism, right? The last option is compatibilism, that free will is possible, but determinism is also true. I accept the principle of sufficient reason, but I also uh, think that I'm still free. Now, how is this possible? Because what we've said is that you have to be a cause of a thing to be free, right? Um, and that the principle of sufficient reason, insofar as it determines, deletes, your power to do otherwise. So we might think of freedom in the folk sense as the power to do otherwise. 
And determinism makes that impossible. You're the man locked in the room. You don't have the power to do otherwise. But you might think you're still free. Even if you don't have the power to do otherwise, the door is locked, you still have free will. This is called a compatibilist position because your freedom is supposed to be compatible with determinism. Now, how is this possible? Well, you have to rethink what free will means, right? So um, what's Sider's example? Uh, a football player is allowed to tackle or is supposed to like tackle or like put the, the ball carrier on the ground and that they, they are allowed to do this by tackling, but they're not allowed to do it by shooting a crossbow at the person, right? That's against the rules. So they're determined, they're constrained, but they still have some kind of freedom. Um, we must reconceive of the notion of freedom in general to make it consistent with uh, determinism. And the way that this is typically done, most famously done, um, is that a free action is one that is caused by the person's beliefs and desires. It's something internal. Provided that those beliefs and desires flow from who the person is. So we have this internal notion of freedom that doesn't have to do with consequences because they don't matter, right? The world is determined. What's going to happen will happen no matter what. Um, but if our choice is consistent with who and what we are, then we can say that the choice is free. Now, how does this work? Uh, there's a distinction between first and second order desires that gets made. This is a move by Harry Frankfurt, who I think just passed away. Super famous philosopher and awesome, awesome guy. So first order desires are like, I want a cherry pie. I, I really desire cherry pie all the time. Second order desires are something like, I'm on a diet or I want to remain healthy, right? Anytime cherry pie is put in front of me, I'm going to like want it, right? Uh, but my second order desires like, should like exercise restraint here. I don't want to want it. This is why it's called a second order desire. Um, you might think of the addict, right? So the addict really wants the heroin, but they don't want to want it. This is why it's so dysphoric to be, a heroin addict it like sucks and these people live awful dysphoric lives and they're really sad and they need therapy and help and rehabilitation um it's like a mental illness issue and the the reason it's a mental illness issue is because of this schism this break between first and second order desires so the second order desire is supposed to be indicative of like who and what you really are in the sense of the cider quote my second order desires to remain healthy and fit and I'll have first order desires for really good, like this looks like amazing cherry pie, um, all the time. I can't help it. Uh, and it's only when my first order desires are consistent with my second order desires that my choice can be considered free. And this isn't free in the power to do otherwise, but it's free in the sense of something internal is clicking. It's working together that I am living the life that I want to live in the way that I want to live it, even if I couldn't do otherwise, this is what we mean by free, that you're not coerced, that you're not constrained, but rather that whatever it is that you are, determined though it may be, and whatever it is that you're doing, uh, determined though it is, are consistent with one another. So the addict who really wants to do heroin and does it is free, right? The uh, me who uh, really wants to remain healthy and fit, there's a cherry pie in front of me, I say, I don't want that. I'm free. It's a free choice. However, if I wantonly like stuff my face into a like you know motorboat the cherry pie, um, then I'm in trouble. That was a, a choice in which my first order desire to eat the cherry pie was satisfied at the cost of my second order desire. So I'm out of sync with myself. I'm acting inconsistently, and I'm gonna feel real ashamed and absolutely need to shower the cherry pie off my face, right? Maybe cry a little bit. So if I decide not to eat the cherry pie, then it's a choice that has resulted from who I am, from like a deep personal level, the second order desire. Um, but if I decide to eat it in spite of the desire, then I'm out of sync with myself. Um, so to have free will on this version of compatibilism uh, is to choose in accordance with who or what we truly desire. And even if I was determined to choose in one way or another, I had no power to do otherwise, I'm a man locked in a room, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, just so long as my experience of freedom and others' designation of my moral responsibility depends upon whether my act operates in accordance with what I care about, uh, and I act in accordance with what I care about, then I'm free. 
um, for better and for worse. So um, we can apply this compatibilist worldview to say the like child pornography guy with the brain lesion, right? Um, he has a second order desire not to, but his first order desire is to, and he has no impulse control. And so we say, yeah, you, you broke the law, you did something bad, but we recognize this choice is unfree because there's this break in identity, what, what he really wants and what he can't help himself but to do, right? Um, I wish I could remember the name of the uh, Radiolab episode, because there's a really interesting one that deals with, with this issue of free will and more responsibility in this. Um, does anybody want to point out a problem with this version of compatibilism? Want to try? I'm not sure if this is quite that, but I was wondering, like, so if someone is not very good at like controlling their impulses, like I would probably definitely be very Yeah, if you don't have the second order desire, then it wouldn't be constitutive of like who you are. Like what, what is supposed to be constitutive of who we are is like our set of second order desires. Um, like I uh, want to be, um, you know, uh, rational. I want to be uh, philosophically creative. I wanna be precise. I wanna be um, fun. I wanna be, you know, myself or whatever. And as long as all of my actions are consistent with those second order desires, then I'm free. Um, but if I don't have a second order desire uh, under which some sort of like temptation or whatever first order desire might um, play, then I'm not sure it would make a difference to identity. So who you are is what you want to be. Yeah, I like what we sort of like holistically want for ourselves. Right, your your values, your ideals, what you hope to do, and, and what your motivations are. Right. So if you act in con, if you act contrary to your motives, then you're not acting freely. Um, you're acting uh, uh, wantonly, right? For the sake of first desire, for first order desire only. Um, anybody else? Anybody see a problem with this version of compatibilism? No, because the compatibilist accepts determinism. It's like, it's like soft determinism, right? So they're accepting the premise that every cause is every event is sufficiently explained by its cause, and then that chain of causes goes back ad infinitum, right? So there's no power to do otherwise. There's no alternative. There's only what happens, right? Um, and freedom is not a matter of changing what happens or causing something else to happen, but rather being emotively or like internal attitudes consistent with what happens. It just doesn't seem like a definition of free will that I don't know, it's not intuitive. No one would come up with this just on their own. Yep, yeah. It, it, it's not a definition of free will is the comment. Nobody would come up with it on their own. Soft determinism is sort of like a contrivance of the problem of free will as presented. So like we start talking about free will and we think, oh, well, the world's determined, but I also feel free. How do I explain that? Um, well, maybe I can just say they're both right, right? But then freedom becomes, we have to change what we mean by freedom because we don't have the power to do otherwise anymore. We're not causing different sources courses of events. Um, we're saying that freedom is like this consistency between first and second order desire. That doesn't like, that, that's not what I mean when I say I chose to come to class today. I mean, I might've wanted to come to class and I might've wanted to be the sort of person that always shows up to class. And so I'm consistent, but you know, like I feel like I could have chosen to stay at home. And that's what I mean by freedom is really that sort of thing. So that what the compatibilist does is they need to define freedom as something that we don't really mean when we say that we're free. Um, and it, they do it in contrivance to make it consistent with their scientific empirical intuitions, the principles of Christian reason, determinism, etc. Now, you might also say in that vein of thought that, well, dang, it's real unfortunate if your first and second order desires as a soft compatibilist aren't 
consistent with one another. Some people will be free and some people won't, and there's nothing to be done about it. So aren't you glad you're one of the lucky ones, right? Or woe be you, you are not one of the lucky ones, right? Because there's no otherwise. Is this what we mean? Is this what we mean by freedom, right? Do we mean like, well, I'm lucky. My desires are consistent with one another, so I must be free. Uh, but I couldn't help that. It just happened that I am this way. I actually, when I was reading the reading, I felt like the first or second quarter thing was sort of uh, like a side thing and not really the main point of it. I just feel like the issue that makes it feel unintuitive is the way that the quarters are defined, really. Like, I think the core of the argument for self determination made a lot of sense to me, like the idea that there are. Uh, well, like even our intuitions at the beginning that there are real choices or there are choices that aren't forced and ones that are. I think like if you sort of, I don't agree with the first order, second order thing either, but I think there are some cases in which, oh, this is hard to explain, <laughs> like the things that cause you to act on your first order instead of second order, some things are legitimate and like uh, defeating or, or actually defeating free will like you're talking about with the guns and like mm -hmm. addiction and things like that and some things like um not having good impulse control aren't don't count as like a legitimate reason to say that you're not acting in your first order good so th this this means you agree with cider um at least in motivation which is i think all that cider is trying to do in this video like he's overviewing the whole free will debate but he's still sort of says compatibilism is probably right or the best way to go. Um, and every iteration of compatibilism has its own objections and reasons to say like, that's not what we mean by free. What the hell are you talking about, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep thinking in the compatibilist vein because uh, science works and that requires principle of sufficient reason. It would be ridiculous to give up principle of sufficient reason. Um, like Lewis Carroll, uh, Alice in Wonderland, ridiculous, right? Um, but we might want to drill down on what we mean by first and second order desires. Are there third order desires? Um, and what this consistency is supposed to be made of and how it gets defeated or satisfied. And this is what compatibilists do, right? There's a whole massive literature on compatibilism that uh, tries to provide a satisfactory notion of freedom that can be consistent with determinism. Uh, and this is just the most famous one, sort of like the really big one, I think like 1967 is maybe when the paper got published, 70 something maybe. <laughs> um, but it, it blows up the compatibilist literature and makes it a, a huge um, area of debate. Uh, and your line of thinking and saying like, well, maybe like what satisfies the connection between first and second order desires and what doesn't, this is like the persistification that's done in, in that literature. So it's thinking in the right direction, according to Sider. Any other final questions? Oh, how about this? Um, don't leave yet. Screenshot. Did this one at the end. Uh, okay, so um, who has free will? One, two, three, four, five. Online, six. Who has free will? Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Who doesn't have free will? Okay, everybody online is convinced. Not everybody in person is convinced. Does anybody want to feel the uh, objection to free will? I'm just very convinced by our determinism, maybe oh. incompatibilism. And it doesn't seem that bad to just give up. Yeah, it doesn't feel that bad to give up. Hard determinism and determinism. Well, whatever, it's not up to us anyways, right? <laughs> okay, um, go freely or not. See you next week. <laughs>